Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Fagan, my haematologist in Cardiff. I'm delighted to be invited by Leukemia Care to talk to my colleague here, Anna Shu, about the highlights of the American Society Haematology Meeting here in San Diego. A lot of what goes on at the meeting in America is high science, high clinical, but actually what Leukemia Care are funding this year and trying to achieve is a different thing. They want to bring that sort of knowledge, that state-of-the-art thinking to the patient out there. And I'm really, really delighted that they're A, trying to do it, and B, they've invited Anna, who's the president of the CLL Forum in the UK, to talk about the highlights, as she and I have seen them so far, in this meeting. Because at this meeting, the best of world research is usually presented in CLL. So, Anna, it's only day three of five. What have been your highlights to the, this particular moment? So um, the highlights so far of the ASH meeting, and as you say, it's, um, there's still two more days uh, to come, yeah. um, has been the session at the Presidential Symposium today, which is where the best abstracts are selected yeah. for the American Society of Hematology. And it was a big study, a, a randomized study, um, from the American uh, group, so lots of different um, clinicians were involved and they compared bendamustine and rituximab with ibrutinib and rituximab and ibrutinib on its own. Um, and um, so the idea was, was really that we know that ibrutinib works and it works really well. We, we already know that, know that it works better than chlorambucil mm. um, in patients who've never had any treatment, but of course um, there's hardly anybody using Clarambucil um, anymore. And so uh, usually we would give uh, bendamustine rituximab to patients who have um, uh, maybe other uh, diseases um, as mm. well as having CLL. So, uh, so this was an important comparison. Uh, and what the study showed was essentially that um, both abrutinib on its own and abrutinib and rituximab are a lot better with respect to um, what we call the progression-free survival. So what that means is that, that patients um, will stay without CLL for much longer when they're having abrutinib um, rather than um, bendamustine yeah. and rituximab. There was also, um, it was very clear that there were more side effects from the chemotherapy. Yeah. Um, although there was, um, as we have seen in the other abrutinib studies, um, also side effects with abrutinib, as one would expect. Well, exactly. You, you, you never get anything for nothing, do you? And, and the idea is this non-chemotherapy regimen. It sounds great because mm. the implication for patients, it means non-toxicity. It's not, not non-toxicity, it's different. It's, there's toxicity. different, yes. And it and was in particular the high blood pressure and the irregular heart rate that stood out again compared to um, chemotherapy. But you're comparing that with things like uh, neutropenic sepsis, life life-threatening complications that you can get with chemotherapy. So everything's relative. So yes. although it, it looked very much like a step forward, it's not quite, we can all stop worrying, is it? I think so. And also, we, this is still very early data, so we still have to see um, whether this will also translate into um, you know, survival um, advantage in the end, which will be maybe difficult to show with this study because the patients who were started on the chemotherapy, when they then, when the CLO came back, they were allowed to go on to abrutinib as one would, um, you know, expect and hope. Oh, but a absolutely, you know, the ethics of a study, the ab ability to cross over yes. to what may or may not be the better arm is yes. a pivotal thing yes. of how we move the, the information forward on yes. behalf of benefit. So, so uh, what do you think, what was your highlight then? Do you have a my, you have my anything highlight, else? Um, well, I know the abrutinib story, I know the Vedeticlac story, and there's other stories going along about what I would call therapies, oral therapies, etc. The thing for me today, uh, especially, was CAR T therapy. They, that's chimeric antigen T cell therapy, which is being licensed already. It's going to be available in the UK through NICE for diffuse large B cell mm -hmm. lymphoma and acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. And on paper, it's always looked like it should work in CLL. But the early studies have been rather disappointing. Mm. And there were three presentations this morning 
which all actually move that story on in terms of safety and efficacy for patients. And actually, it looks like we may have potential cures. The data is phenomenally uh, immature, but they can clearly do things that other therapists can't. Mm. And that includes patients who've had five or six previous lines of therapies. And as you know and I know, there has not been an opportunity in the past. It's been almost diminishing returns as you go through the various rounds of therapy. It looks like we suddenly have something which is capable of always turning the clock back. Mm -hmm. Well, that means cure or not, the data is much too premature. But it certainly appears to do something that the other therapies can't. And that's phenomenally exciting. It may not be for all patients, because A, they don't need it, and B, they not be suitable. Mm. But actually, uh, having seen the technology in, in diffuse large B cell, and infoblastic lymphoma for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, sorry, for a few years, it's great. It now looks like the companies are concentrated on CLL and bring that benefit to the patients we treat. Mm. Yes, I mean, I, I, um, I was always very critical of CAR T-cells, but I, I think that the, um, the data now matures as it matures and um, we have more, gained more experience. And there, it was good that the studies combined um, um, the CAR T-cells with ibrutinib, uh, which seems to have a positive effect on the side effect um, profile as yeah. well. What I did realise also was that there were a lot of um, presentations um, about minimal residual disease yes. measurements. And yeah. I get the impression that the, the field is moving forward, that we're using more and more minimal residual disease measurement as a way of, of identifying the best therapies and the most efficacious therapies. So the, the CAR T cells, a lot of patients um, showed yeah. that they were becoming MRD negative. Whether that means cure, as you say, you know, only time will tell. Yeah, um, and of course the MRT negative data is a a UK thing largely. Yes. You know, Pioneer through Leeds and Peter Hillman, that actually with chemo chemo immunotherapy, your depth of MRD matters. Mm -hmm. and what do you achieve with the therapy you've had? That's the muddy, the water being muddied by ibrutinib. Yes. Because we have long term survival with ibrutinib who don't achieve MRD negative. Whether that is relevant to CAR T. I suspect it will be because I, actually, I yes. um, CAR T therapy is at the end of the it's a cytotoxic therapy where a brutinib is probably doing many, many things of which cytotoxicity is one of its uh, benefits. It may be, it may not be the, the be all and end all of it. Yes. Um, but we need to follow this space mm. very closely. Because it may be after CAR T that achieving MRD negative is very important mm -hmm. or isn't very important. Yes. We need to know that yes. fact. Yes. Yes. Is it like chemotherapy? You give your therapy, the disease has to be got rid of in a, a defined period. Because we know the CAR T cells don't live forever. Yes. And the majority of patients can that induce long term survival or even cure. Whereas the protein is working for a different mechanism, yes. isn't it? The other thing I found interesting at this meeting is that um, we're using these minimal residual disease measurements, either by sequencing or by, by flow cytometry, um, to decide in, within a clinical trial whether you can stop therapy. And again, that is something that I think our patients will like, because, and also the, 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 uh, the Department of Health will like, because yeah. it's, um, it's, uh, it's cheap, it would be cheap if we, were, um, be, if we were able to stop some of those therapies, and then restart them when the CLL comes back um, at a very low level. But these, these studies are um, now very mature, and we need to do more yeah. studies to find out whether this is really the way forward. I have two comments about that, and there's nothing, nothing cheap in the therapies we're handing yes. out now. No, no. But the testing and monitoring, it needs to be standardised. So if you're having your test done in Nottingham or Cardiff or Oxford yes. or Leeds that would be or the whatever. Challenge. Mm. And there, but there are European groups working on that so we can mm. actually standardise um, what does MRD negative mean mm. across the UK because there are different methods, genetic methods, flow cytometry methods, that can the patient see the same benefit uh, if they're told it's MRD negative, what actually does that mean? So there's a lot of work going on in the background. Yes. 
ab about all this. And I think it's very exciting because patients don't necessarily want to take treatment no. for five, ten years, do they? And they have side effects and, and uh, you know, mild side effects that can be tolerated for six months with, you know, like regimens yeah. like chemotherapy. They'd be very intolerable um, when you're on the drug for you know, five years. So having a drug holiday is something that will yeah. appeal to patients, I'm sure. Yeah. And of course, we used to say with mm. immunotherapy, no pain, no gain. That's fine if it's a six months defined thing. Mm. Mm. The patient knows I've got to put up with this for six months or yes. 12 months. Yes. That's slightly different if you're talking about five years or 10 years. It's yes. I mean, with all this exciting data coming out, I can see that we have to rewrite the British Society of Hematology guidelines at some point in the not too distant future. Oh my future. God, not again. We've only <laughs> just done them. Not again. That'll be a nightmare. But I think looking forward, we have lots of tools in the box, being from even chemotherapy, but maybe people are thinking about can we achieve the same things with non chemotherapy regimens, the mm. flare studies, phenomenally important in the UK, FCR. Um, it's been brilliant, you know, 90% plus response. Yes. Um, does that mean they will live longer? Well, the world data says they live a very long time. Can we do better with non-chemotherapy regimens? It's a tall ask, mm. but maybe we can. Yes. Uh, maybe we can. It's a great problem to have. You and I have been around, I've been around longer than you, but we've been around <laughs> a little while. And we only had chemotherapy. We have all these new tools in the box. We've got mm. to learn how to use them. The butyl phonetic oxide, alalazib, CAR T, allografting. We've not touched on allografting. And it's quite interesting. I've been to ask for so long. When I started CLL in sort of 87, the only way to cure was allograft. Mm -hmm. But what does cure mean? Does cure mean long-term survival, as in you, you would die what the good Lord had set for you anyway? Yes. Yeah, dementia, heart attack, stroke. Or does it mean disease eradication? What's your thoughts about, actually, from the patient perspective, uh, of long-term survival? Well, I like the idea of uh, the functional cure, which basically means that um, patients, you know, if they have to die, we all have to die, but they wouldn't die of uh, CLL. Yeah. And I think that's as far as, as CLL doctors uh, we can go, you know, in our aims. Um, and, and clearly, if, if uh, you know, we are dealing with a patient population that by large is um, probably older than 65 years old and so um, you know to, to mm -hmm. get patients to their expected life expectancy i.e. 82, 85 I think that should be the, mm -hmm. the goal. And I've got exciting things about the, the update on the Murano study because CLL upfront therapy is the first toe in the water for a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether the treatment is going to work one year or 15 or 20 mm -hmm. years. Yes. The relapse of fracture have been a historical problem for us. And Murano using venetic acts with Tuximab does appear to MRD negativity and uh, progression of free survival better maybe, I would suggest, than any other treatment we've had to date. Yes. What's your thoughts mm -hmm. about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. And it's attractive that it is a fixed duration of therapy um, for two years. So, uh, as we said before, patients are not on treatment all the time. Um, it's less costly. And, and also, one would imagine over time that if patients come off after two years and then they, the CLL comes back, it's not a proper relapse because they, we just stopped the therapy. So you would yeah. actually then envisage restarting the same treatment again and you would you would hope that this same treatment would still work. And so from a patient perspective, that it may not be prolonged therapy, which may mm. or may not be acceptable. It may not be prolonged therapy, which may or may not have toxicity, such as hypertension, atrial fibrillation. It's a defined period. And it's almost like um, a treatment holiday. Mm. I don't like to use the word holiday when you talk about people with cancer having therapy. Mm. But that actually means like off treatment. It's like being a diabetic, you said you don't need insulin for three years. Mm. Well, actually, every, every diabetic will welcome that. Yes. Yeah. Provided when you restart the insulin, you get it the same works. benefit yes. mm. as you had. Yes. 
before you stop That's it. why we need clinical trials to do this within clinical trials so that we can um, you know, control for that possibility that it might not work. Uh, mm. What's your assessment? We, we come to the American Society and we told you every year. You and I are enthusiasts about the illness and the progress, but if you're looking at it from a patient perspective, is your feeling that the optimism we sort of generated that Abrutinib delivered in 2012, 2013, we certainly have something we didn't have before. Yes. Is the new therapist coming through and the new data coming through, are we still right to believe that actually, although we can't guarantee anything, it's moment in time, we're certainly moving in the right direction? I think so, definitely. I think I, you know, there was a phase maybe two, three years ago where I thought, oh, we, you know, now it's from now on it will be steady progress, but we, we actually see that there's a continuous accelerated progress because of the combination of different new agents, because there's still new agents coming through, um, because of CAR T cells, uh, because now also of being able to maybe stop therapy at some point. There is progress um, on all fronts. And I f personally, I find that this you know, 2018 ASH meeting is uh, the best one since the first presentation of Abrutinib, which I can't remember, was 2013 probably. And let me ask you a very unfair question, and I'll give my answer after yours. So we know there's stage A patients yes. who may never need treatment. Yes. We don't may necessarily know who they are when we first meet them. And we have a conversation with them about what the future may be. Um, I'll go first on this question. I usually say that actually, you look like you have early stage disease. We do not know what the future means for you. And I usually use the term, I have tools in the box mm. that should things need fixing, I'm very confident we can do it. And they have those patients who need treatment up front, mm -hmm. which are the more difficult lot. What's our message to them? I think it's the same. I mean, because I think what I tell patients, whether they are stage A or whether they need treatment, um, that we now have so many tools that I would think that the vast majority of patients will reach their um, expected life expectancy. That's what I'm very optimistic because, you know, when you go, obviously when you go in online and patients look at the internet and so on, they see, they still see these figures, you, can li you will live between 10 and 20 years. Now that figure was derived at a time when we were only having one or two tools in the box, yeah. whereas now we have many more tools and combinations of different tools. So, so I'm very optimistic that patients who are being diagnosed um, on required treatment in 2018 will be around for a long, long time. And actually, uh, amazingly, that's exactly what I say to my patients, that, that we can't get to it for 100%. Hmm. Funny things happen, but if you behave the way we expect, you have a very high chance of a normal life expectancy. Yes. But I think things are going to get even better mm. because we're talking about the tools in the box, which are therapies, which we're applying to a herd of people. Yes. If you go to your modern car, when I was a lad, I knew how my car worked. I knew how to fix it. I removed this piece, the carpet, whatever. You now have to take a computer in to tell you what's wrong with the car. Mm. But next generation sequencing is actually going to give us information about the individual car. Yes. They may all be an Audi or a VW or, or any other vehicle, but when they go wrong, the, uh, the, um, the necessary therapies put in work may not be the same for the individual car. We're moving towards individual patients, aren't we? Yes, I think so. And the, and the sequencing um, and characterization of the individual leukemia, each patient's in the, you know, leukemia is different, that will play a role. I think it's part of a bigger jigsaw puzzle because all the other you know, more classical parameters also play a role. It still plays a very important role whether uh, patients have got um, uh, in a family help and, and backup where they, there's many, many things that come into play when we decide on oh. therapy. That's not going to go away um, with sequencing, but the sequencing will make 
you know, the decision about treatment more precise. Yeah. Lovely. Mm. Thank you very much, Anna. And Thanks. Great pleasure. Work. Yeah. Great work you're doing. Thank you very much indeed.